All right, y'all. Let's go ahead and get started. So I was fairly happy with the exam grades that I've been seeing so far. Um, y'all have averaged about an 80, so not terrible. Um, with like 50% of people getting A's, a good number of y'all getting B's, and then of course there are some lower grades that are dragging down that average a bit. The median is probably closer to an 85, so pretty good overall. Um, I'm not completely done putting all the grades in yet. Um, it'll probably be another couple days because I'm still waiting stuff to get back from SAS. And I just picked up the Scantrons from the testing center today. So as always, there's probably at least two Scantrons that they didn't get in properly. So I'll have to go and hand grade up all that stuff. But don't stress if you don't see your grade immediately. If you took it via Scantron, it should be up here shortly. If by some chance um, you, dip, you took the test in person, and you turned in your Scantron and everything, and it shows up as a zero later on in the week, let me know immediately. I'll look through all of those Scantrons and just take a look. Because sometimes when they're doing that mass processing of like a hundred of them, they just miss one or two and it doesn't get properly recorded. So it's not a big deal. I just want to make sure that if you took it in person, just let me know and we'll make sure it gets fixed. Um, as far as for those of y'all that missed the test, and this is probably mostly going towards the people that are not here in person today, um, please let me know uh, as soon as possible if you have an excused absence, because if you have an excused absence, I can open up the test for you. We can try to like at least get you to not have a zero for a test. Um, but if it's outside of those very specific excuses from the syllabus, there's not much I can do unless you have that documented evidence. It sucks, It is, but it is the way it is. And we have to be fair to everybody who took the test on time and did things the right way. So. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with our typical rundown of things. Um, quiz 12 is due on Sunday at our typical time. There's only two or more of these left after this one, with one of those spanning two weeks, technically because of Thanksgiving, it's really just one week, but you know, I'd rather give you all the full two weeks to take the quiz and study. Um, so nothing too crazy. The final exam is also on December 10th at um, 10 a.m. in here. So it'll be a little bit of a different time, but all of that information should be up on web courses. If you have any questions about any of that stuff, please don't hesitate to reach out. Y'all know me, I'm here to help y'all. I want y'all to do well in here. Just don't hesitate to reach out. There's office hours. I'm happy to schedule stuff outside of time with that. So if you, you have questions or if you're struggling in here, come talk to me. Uh, does anybody have any questions before we go ahead and get started with actual today's stuff? Yes. Why is the final exam So for those of y'all that are kind of new to UCF um, or new to college in general, during finals week, everything's a little bit different. So what happens is, is basically, so since you're taking this class Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 12 p.m. to 1 or 1 p.m., whatever, they set aside a block of three hours for y'all to take the final exam. Because most of the time, it's usually a lot more cumulative and all that kind of thing. I don't like cumulative exams. We have way too much stuff to cover in here that don't necessarily always connect. So it's easier for me and for y'all, I think, to just go ahead and do a unit exam and take it up during our normal time. So it's just how they kind of structure finals. So basically for that like last week and a half of classes, you won't have classes anymore. You'll just have your scheduled tests and probably be studying your ass off. So hopefully not too hard for this one. Most of the stuff that we're gonna cover from now on it's kind of fun stuff. It's ecology, it's conservation, it's neat things about the natural history of Florida, some of the weird things that we deal with here because we have a lot of invasive species, that kind of stuff. So it'll be a little bit more fun. Um, there'll be some vlog segments, a lot more videos, a lot of that kind of thing. So hopefully we'll have a little bit more fun with it. All right, any other questions? Cool, let's go ahead and get started. So today is probably the first real lecture for most of y'all, that we're kind of differentiating away from the book a little bit. And we're going to talk about animal behavior today. Because animal behavior does such an important job of shaping how an organism functions on the landscape that's important to talk about. As well, it'll set up our final connection with biology assignment that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Now, as we talked about back in unit two, the nervous system governs responses to stimuli, right? If you see stimuli A, you're going to respond to it via a very specific 
And that's, that's the same thing for humans, it's the same thing for other animals, the same thing for little flatworms, all that kind of fun stuff. Now, a lot of that can be coded via genes. So say for instance, genes specifically um, specifying substances required to construct that nervous system, um, as well as the mechanisms that it uses to respond to specific stimuli. So arguably, uh, question, there are questions to be asked of, do these genes actually control the behavior if they're controlling the structure or the composition of those systems? Let's talk about genetic controlled behavior. Now, things like hygienic behavior in honeybees, where honeybees will kind of systematically clean themselves, um, is just always there, right? And this is, again, to cut down the spread of diseases, some of these have these hygienic workers that remove dead larvae and pupae from the root nest, so that way those dead animals don't build up the pathogens and stuff that's inside the nest itself and kill off everything else. Now, this hygienic behavior has two components. You have the uncapping of cells into those dead bees and the removal of the dead bees. So when we're talking about the genetic control of this, if you were to cross these hygienic bees with non-hygienic bees, um, you can argue that this uh, behavior was controlled by two genes with two little bit of each gene. Uh, so you have hygienic bees that have UURR and the homozygous R ones that have big U, big U, big R, big R. Now, if you have little U, little U, big R, the bees will uncap the cells, but they'll not remove. If you have big U, little R, little R, they'll remove the bees, but if cells are intact, if they are intact, but only if you have both of those recessive traits. Well, you have both uncapping of the cells and removing the bees. You can see how they're, especially on like the more basal level of behavior, maybe some genetic control for it. This all kind of brings us to the big point I want to get to here, instinct versus learning. So instinct is simply a behavior that's performed without having to first be learned by an actual experience in the environment. Obviously, you kind of hear this often colloquially talked about, even if with regard to like humans having instincts, which that's somewhat negligible. Um, for instance, the web making of spiders is an example of a genetically determined or a instinctive behavior. They don't have to be taught how to do these things. It just kind of comes up and happens. And as a result, there's very little variation between individuals and in how they construct the web. It, it is constructed similarly each time they do it. It's not like they're improving their design every single time. So what is the difference between instinct and learning? Now, learning is the modification of behavior or thoughts of specific experiences. For instance, learned behaviors of animals can be classified in a bunch of different various ways. We have associative learning, which is where an animal learns to associate one stimulus with another. For instance, you have classic, uh, classic Pavlov's conditioning, where if you expose a dog to uh, food, it's going to have its mouth start watering because it's ready to eat, right? Now, if you do it at the exact same time, as hitting a tuning fork, you can over time condition that dog to, as soon as it hears that, that tuning fork, it'll start salivating because it thinks that food is coming from a mental perspective. It's not like it's behaviorally thinking, oh, I'm hearing that and thus that means this. It's just something that can be kind of programmed in the back of the mind and not really thought. And then this, there's also observational learning or modeling which is where an animal learns the behavior through watching other animals conduct that behavior. Now, this is primarily seen in primates, dolphins, uh, elephants do this a lot, things like dogs, big cats, a lot of that sort of thing. And this allows for a lot more success in things like pack hunting. It allows for development of new techniques. For instance, there are some killer whales in some parts of the world that know how to hunt very differently than the other ones on the other side of the globe for the same kind of prey item. Some may use things like bubble nets where they blow little air bubbles into the water column and use that to surround fish and basically trap them in a little spot. Whereas some will actually drive them onto the shore and then eat them that way. It just kind of depends on the situation and what kind of prey you're going after. So here's a quick little video example of this. But y'all can see very quickly how you can have this one specific behavior get learned, and then it gets massively amplified in these groups. And again, this happens in obviously primates like us and you know other primate species. But you see this in dolphins. You see this in uh, a lot of other large carnivores. 
as well. So it, it's really fascinating and you can really learn a lot by just kind of studying how these interactions occur. So again, this brings us back to this concept of instinct versus learning, that nature versus nurture debate that's kind of underpinning a lot of things like psychology. So obviously we think about this often from a very human perspective, but it's just as easy that we can apply these kinds of questions to animal systems as well. So obviously there's been a debate among human psychologists as well as animal behaviorists concerning this relative importance of either instinctual versus learned behavior. And the fact is influencing these learned behaviors in the environment in which the animal is placed. And thus this debate is often referred to as the nature versus character debate, where you have that nature where you've got those genes or that more instinctual side of learning or of behavior versus nurture, which is much more of that environment which is explained by you know, cultural learning, that kind of thing. And cultural learning is almost in, its, in, a, in a way its own form of evolution. Think about just the progression of human societies from say 1600 to two, the, you know, the modern era. In those 400 years, look how far we've come just based off of our cultural understanding of things like electricity, coal powered uh, plants, nuclear power, all that stuff. It all factors into how our brains function and it kind of brought us to a different plane than we were, say, 400 years ago. So this brings up that concept of the adaptive value of behavior. So obviously becomes forms of behavior have a genetic basis. There are subject to evolution by natural selection, as well as you have that cultural evolution like we were talking about, for, from, for instance, it's in that cat example. It started with just one animal washing a potato, but over the time, they've learned that certain foods are a lot easier to clean and taste better and have more nutritious value. Not like they think about those things, but it's just they've noticed that those animals that do that end up doing better. And then you start learning things like, oh, well, if I need to go out here and go swimming, so that way if I fall in, I don't die and drown, that's something I need to learn, that kind of stuff. Now, ultimately, if a behavior is adaptive, it must promote those individuals' produce, production of offspring. Just like in, when we were talking about evolution and other concepts, the individuals that do the best are going to be the ones that survive and reproduce, right? And so in order for it to be a truly adaptive behavior, something that's being passed from generation to generation, it needs to improve the likelihood that that group is going to do better. For instance, African wild dogs are probably some of the best hunters and uh, across the plains of like the Serengeti, so places like Kenya, Tanzania, that sort of thing. And a lot of that has to do with their very tight social structures that allow them to learn from each other as how to best take down certain kinds of prey. And as a result, they do better than other similarly non-learned species in the same locations. They have you know, efficacy rates in the 80 to 90% range, instead of things like big cats, like lions or leopards, having down around 10 to 30%, depending on the circumstances. This also leads to it, some interesting behaviors that can be directly as a result of specific morphologies. For instance, we kind of talked about it a little bit with things like sexual selection. You have these massive, you know, beautiful feathers that you see in male birds sometimes, or attract females, beautiful colors that you can see in fish, or even in mammals, like things like a mandrel or just your classic baboons where they have these bright, beautiful colors on the face or their ass. Um, all that stuff, it kind of helps them to adapt and fit into these behavioral traits that kind of accentuate those particular things. So here's a great example of that. Very quickly, like the calling, the very exaggerated behaviors to emphasize these really beautiful, bright, showy plumages, right? All of that is done to, you know, make themselves look bigger, make themselves look more evolutionarily fit. And as a result, these kinds of traits and behaviors can get passed down from generation to generation. And birds in particular is absolutely fascinating because there's so many different systems that they all kind of fall into that all come back to the fact that oftentimes, particularly in birds, you have this very female driven sex based selection you'll have a female actively seeking out males that is most fit. And as a result, you see some just really awesome, interesting displays that show just how fit these males are from a genetic perspective. It can be everything from bald eagles falling thousands of feet out of the sky with clasped um, claws together just to see how strong they are, to things like rough grouse coming out and just drumming the table for, to try to draw attention in. <laughs> 
and all of that stuff is primarily instinctual. There is some element of learning to it, but it's usually just a very quick, oh, I'm going to watch the other adults around me. It's not as cultural as, say, something like the soft mechanics. So you can also have other adaptive behavior, things like a selfish herder, simply by their physical position in the group, some individuals are going to form that living shield against protection. Things like fish or large mammals, you know, bison, deer, what have you, will often form, use that as a way to protect themselves. It's not because they care about the other members of the group. In fact, they'll probably leave them for dead if they get caught, but it's more about protecting the group as a whole by staying in those big, large groups, which makes it a lot more difficult for a predator to take one out. You also have individuals that are better off in a group than they would be individually just by resource acclimation and that sort of stuff. So for example, you can have things like greater vigilance. So if you're all there in a group together, you have 50 eyes looking for something instead of two, that kind of thing. Also less chance of that individual attack where you can be singled out. So here's some great examples of that. Obviously you get, you know, classic big schooling fish, like all these little French guts that you see. Well, of course, things like American bison. But you can also have other kinds of adaptive behavior, things like cooperative living. And this is probably best studied in things like wolves. Harley Mowat has an incredible book out there called Never Cry Wolf. It's a really fascinating story about a guy who, in the 70s, when wolves were just thought to be these vicious man eating killers, just went out into the woods and watched them and tried to learn their behavior. And as a result, a lot of the things that we know about how you have alphas and betas and gamma individuals, where they fall out of the various pecking order, all that stuff is learned from that long term study of those animals out in the wild without human interference as much as possible. You can also see situations where um, this is also very evident in large primates, particularly gorillas or chimpanzees. And that was primarily um, pioneered by people like Jane Goodall, who back in the 60s and 70s went out and observed chimpanzees and gorillas in the uh, mountains of uh, the Congo, instead of just watching them in zoos beat the shit out of each other because they were in poor conditions and poor zoos at the time and just weren't in good social structures. And as a result, the things that we've learned from this can then be brought back into captive situations and made them a lot better. In fact, oftentimes, especially in zoos nowadays, there's a lot of consideration that's taken into how you structure the groups of animals together because obviously certain animals are just not going to like each other. And so you may still see animals that have occasional scrapes and things like that, but that's just part of being an animal, being an organism, and finding your place in that pecking order. You can also have things like, why do males in that video that we watched behave as they do? Obviously, they're trying to attract females, right? So if you have this big showy display, you're much more likely to attract other members of the opposite sex. And so these behaviors and morphologies arise because of that competition for mates, whether it be in birds, frogs, bighorn sheep, all this kind of fun stuff. So clearly there's an adaptive value for behavior. So Darwin realized that simple natural selection is not the only selective force, that all these things have to work together and have to be uh, collaborative in order to take a species from one single species to thousands across the landscape. And thus, these differences among individuals and their success at getting mates is what drives a lot of this. Again, back to that whole sexual selection part. Sexual selection increases that individual's likelihood of reproductive success. And as a result, you see all these different variations of what individuals are more difficult than others. Additionally, you often see things like sexual dimorphism result from that sexual selection, where in birds, like we saw in that example earlier, the males were bright and showy. But the females didn't put any effort into building that because they're putting all their efforts into developing eggs, right? So as a result, those nutrients, that, that energy, all that stuff is being completely focused in different directions based off of what those specific group or sexes and a particular organism needs or needs to do to accomplish its goal of reproducing into that next generation. Now, obviously, with sexual selection, if there's something heritable, that's a variation in a trait that affects the ability to obtain mates, you're going to have variants that are conducive to success that will become more common over time, just like in every other form of evolution. And as a result, sexual selection creates these really different selection pressures for males versus females. Things like the rhinoceros beetle that are going to have these big massive horns that get in the way of things like foraging, as well as trying to hide from predators, 
but they need them to be able to compete against other or other males so that way they can impress the females and potentially have a shot at actually reproducing. Now, in general, females typically have much larger parental investments than males. Energy and time to produce offspring and care for them is just much more greatly exaggerated in the females than most species for the males. Not always the case, you do get things like seahorses where you have a lot more male uh, invested fraternity, paternal investment, but typically that's usually where you see it. Now, in most animals, neither parent typically provides care. And granted, this is somewhat changing as we're finding a lot of examples of this actually happening in a much more subtle way than we used to observe. So it's not always like mammals where you raise your offspring for a year and a half, two years after they're born. You may have simple things like when a female water snake gives birth, live birth to your young, there's particular scents that each one of them will learn. And so when those little young water snakes are threatened, they'll go find mom and they'll hang out by her to be protected. So she's probably three or four times the size. Now, Obviously, it's hard to it's a lot harder to see those kinds of parental investments unless you're looking for them. And so things like reptiles and amphibians in particular often don't get you don't get to see that as sort of best people. Um, there's even species of frogs that will go out and be responsible for raising up their offspring by basically laying an infernal egg into a little water body that each one of these little tadpoles is being raised up in. And they're called uh, ulufaga or egg, egg eater frogs. They're very similar to like those classic poison dark frogs that you see, but they're hyper specialized and they have very special behaviors that allow them to succeed in these very weird circumstances. So ultimately, access to mates is limited for both males, but not always females. And thus, if you have that situation, the males will usually be more competitive and the females are typically going to be a lot more choosy with what kind of partners they're looking for. This leads to two outcomes. Either a male or a couple of males directly monopolize all the access to the females and will fight with each other. So females will mate with the winners, and that's called intersexual selection, which is usually dominated by male and male combat. Things like the gopher tortoises that we saw battling the other day, um, bighorn sheep, rhinos, elephants, giraffes, obviously the kangaroo here. And this is typically something that you're going to see more in mammals. But you can also have that female choice selection. Where you have in species where males cannot externally control access to females, the males will advertise for mates and females will select among the best advertisers. So that's called intersexual selection female choice. You see this a lot as well, primarily in birds, but you can see that obviously things like these animal lizards here that have those bright colorful blacks that are basically an indication of look how much energy and investment I can put into this bright red thing that differentiates me from the neighbor across the street who can't put as much energy into that bright red dewlap. And so obviously combat becomes kind of a big role in this. So in species where males actually fight, they often have secondary sexual characteristics that often evolve kind of as a part of it. Things like large body size, weaponry, armor. Obviously you don't just evolve these big massive uh, antlers for no reason. Things like giraffes, which have these big massive horns at the top of their head, which you don't necessarily look for if you're not seeing them that are basically used as battering ramps. So they'll use their entire neck and just swing it across and will gouge out the, the other giraffes they're fighting with. Those tortoises, like we talked about, they had those big Euler scutes that were right at the bottom of their neck that they could use to jab in between the space between the shell and try to kill the other one and flip it over. So it gets really fascinating really quickly. Here's another great example of that. But you can see just how cool some of these systems have evolved that are absolutely fascinating and kind of terrifying because more often than not, these animals will kill each other if they can. Doesn't always happen. In fact, oftentimes when a male knows it's, or really any individual knows that it's been beat, it will usually back down and kind of go the other direction. And as a result, you kind of also see like these seeding over things like territories and all that kind of fun stuff. And oftentimes when you have these big battles that'll happen and a new male comes in and takes over a new a new area, say for instance, a lion takes over a new pride, that male lion will go and kill every single offspring that are currently in that pride. Because it will be his offspring that he wants to keep around. He's not gonna put any effort into uh, you know, taking care of the ones that were there previous. 
Now, obviously, that's not always an effective strategy to go beat the shit out of each other. So sometimes you might develop other alternative strategies for uh, mating, things like sneaky males, which, for instance, in some fish, as smaller males don't necessarily hold territory. They're just too small. They don't. They're not able to reproduce as well. And as a result, they instead hide near the female in the territory of another male and attempt to sneak in and mate with her, often appearing almost exactly like the female itself. So this is especially in the case of things like bass or bluegill, where you'll have this very strong, well-developed territory, and they'll basically not, especially for younger males that haven't fully developed their adult like sexual dimorphic characteristics, they'll just kind of hang out there and use their more juvenile colorations to blend in with the females a lot better. You can also think have things like sperm competition, where even if you can't physically compete with each other, you may have some sort of specialized advantage where um, your sperm is much better at fertilizing eggs than others. So if more than one male will mate with a female in a short time period, offspring may be fathered by more than one male. And you see this in a lot of different organisms, lizards, snakes, humans, sometimes even, which traits can lead to winning sperm competition to be differentiated. So, Oftentimes, these traits that lead to that winning sperm competition are everything from large ejaculates, prolonged copulation, inserting of things like a copulatory plug, which blocks out the reproductive tract. So you see this a lot in snakes. Um, apply pheromones to reduce the female's attractiveness to future males. And some even crazier examples have things like damselflies that have a special structure that's there to basically scoop out any sperm from previous males. You can actually see an example of us here where they have this extra hook that's there to kind of dig out and destroy everything that's already there present. It's crazy what weird things have evolved to kind of get the edge on another organism. Now, kind of coming back to female choice selection. Now, if a male can't monopolize those resources, then those males have to find ways to advertise themselves for those potential mates. As so the females have to inspect those advertisements and select the best mate based off of which one is doing the best and biggest show, if you will. This leads to the evolution of elaborate courtship displays, both like things like humans, as well as a lot of other organisms as well. So why should a female be choosing? Obviously, it should want to acquire good genes for its offspring and acquire resources from males that it might not necessarily get if it wasn't taking advantage of the system. For instance, a lot of birds will have the male build a really beautiful, large, elaborate nest that the female that can use, then use to lay her eggs in. And all of that part process is that whole learning process, that establishment of this is a behavior that's going to greatly benefit my ability to survive and reproduce. This leads back to this thing called the good gene hypothesis, which is where Ultimately, all of these behaviors should theoretically shape or select for organisms that can handle all of these things and should have good genes. In other words, they're probably better at acquiring food resources and all this stuff because if they can use all their energy to do all these big showy things, probably because they went out and ate a ton and are able to like exist on the landscape better than another organism can. For instance, this was tested in a group where you had these widow birds where they captured 120 males and they had a control group where they cut the tail feathers 20 centimeters, so about two centimeters below the average. And they had an experimental group where they had them even shorter. And then they marked them with an ankle bracelet and released them. Now, when you look at the control group, which is closer to that typical average, those were the ones that were going to have the most number of active nests. Whereas those individuals that had their tails cut dramatically shorter, all of a sudden couldn't reproduce at all because the females found them just to be like, oh, you can't grow a nice, beautiful feather. That means you clearly just aren't healthy enough and you shouldn't be fathering my offspring. And that also can lead to things like the direct benefit hypothesis. So here in hanging flies, that male has to catch insects and secrete the pheromones to attract females. The female is then going to choose the male with the best prey. So she eats that during copulation. And the larger the prey, the longer the copulation. And ultimately, the longer the population, the more sperm can transfer, right? So as a result, because he brought in this nice, big, juicy mantis um, and other large prey items, he keeps the female there longer. He has more chance of getting his reproductive offspring into the world, as well as she's now more fit and could go out and probably produce more eggs than she could have if she didn't have access to those resources. And here you can actually see where they mess with it in the lab. 
where it's, if you just do this in nature and look at the type of prey that they've been in and look at the duration of population versus their body size and all that kind of fun stuff, you can see that there's a very strong relationship between those, those various different things. And as a result, these hanging flies, the females' preference for males with large prey, provide her with more nutrients to lay more eggs. Saves her from having to hunt herself, as well as it allows her to produce more eggs in general. And if a female is still eating after accepting all that male sperm, they'll take away the gift to give it to another female. <laughs> kind of screwed up, but so it is what it is. But again, you have this diversity in sex roles too. So it's not just male versus female in all of these situations. Obviously, there's a lot of other examples as well. So some species have the sex roles reversed. Things like seahorses, water bugs, sand pipers, see that where the male will be responsible for primarily providing all the parental care. And as a result, those males are often more picky. Now, sexual selection, just in summary, obviously that's where we get things like sexual dimorphism, because that's what kind of is causing those differences in males and females is how they're approaching, you know, going about mates. They'll have sexual selection pressures that may be in the opposition of natural selection. Things like those big showy feathers are not necessarily the most beneficial things to have when you're just trying to go out and find food and keep yourself alive. And finally, it's still an evolutionary force that can increase an individual's fitness by attracting better or more mates. Now, one thing I do want to touch on real quick before we get into our last little part here is that diseases and animal behavior can often change things very much too. So how an animal acts can often be directly influenced by its interactions with pathogens. So if you're infected with something, you're probably going to be a lot more lethargic and not want to go out and do things. I'm sure some of y'all had the flu recently. Not like you wanted to get out of bed, right? You're not going to want to go out to the club and look for, you know, dating partners or anything like that. Now, as a result, you can get things like general lethargy, just being tired and not wanting to do stuff. However, in some circumstances, you'll have males that realize, oh shit, I'm about to die. I should go out there and get my butt moving or I'm not gonna have a chance to reproduce. And so you see these increased breeding opportunities, especially in things like frogs, lizards, salamanders, that sort of stuff. As well as you can have some really cool systems that involve things like manipulation where the parasite will actually take over the brain itself and control what that organism does. For instance, a great example of this is the zombie ants. We have an entire lab here on campus that studies this, where basically you have this little parasitic fungus that colonizes an ant. It'll then tell that ant to go back into the colony and try to infect as many other ants as possible. And once it realizes that that ant has been kicked out, it'll tell the ant to climb up onto the top of a tree bite down, and then it'll grow the stock out the back of the head and release the spores again to start the whole process over again. And this sounds absolutely bizarre and crazy, but it happens all the fucking time in the animal world. There's so many different examples of this parasitic manipulation out there. So you can see very quickly that animal behavior is just so shaped and formed by all these different factors from the environment, the cultural aspects of where it's living in. These you know, potential parasitic members that are controlling how they interact. So that kind of big, brings us to kind of a big question here. How can we reliably measure these behaviors and kind of actually inform what kind of research we're doing? So as a result, um, behavior, looking at animal behavior as a science is kind of young, relatively speaking. There's kind of this bias, especially in the animal kingdom of like, oh, humans are better than everything else. So we're not gonna even take time to even look at things like wolves, bears, whatever. And a lot of that stuff didn't really start happening until the 1970s and 1980s or so. And it's not always straightforward. But the thing is, you also but you have to be sure that you define very specific terms and phrases and use very specific given units to define exactly what you're calling specific behavior so you can use it as a reproducible, uh, repetitive thing that you can actually use in true science. So we have to define behaviors in simple terms and context is incredibly important. That brings us to something called the ethogram, which is simply just going out and observing an animal and finding these set of defined behaviors that existed by that specific animal under specific circumstances. This is done a lot in zoo contexts where you're trying to figure out how is an animal responding to particular stressors in the environment. So for instance, one of my undergrads took an animal behavior class where they went out and monitored cheetahs at the Central Florida Zoo. And as a result, um, he was able to determine that they went from being relatively calm and comfortable in their habitats to when they started working on the pathway that ran alongside the, the cage, 
all of a sudden they were freaking out and we're like, nope, don't like this. This is scary. And we're pacing the walls a lot more often. And it was such a marked difference. It was just like night or day compared to what group what time you're talking about. So as an effort to kind of get y'all involved in actually getting to interact and do these kinds of things in the real world, I'm gonna have y'all do one of these. Obviously that's a big part of science is actually conducting the research, right? And so in this lecture, we talk about how you have to structure experiments as well as this math to analyze them over the course of the semester. And today you're going to participate in a relatively basic experiment where we're going to monitor how various factors impact the behaviors of animals that we can observe here on campus, or if y'all are close to campus and aren't able to do that here, we'll find another way to do it. As we mentioned in the lecture, one of the ways to systematically can look at animal behavior is by creating an ethogram. And thus, this ethogram is a recording of the conditions and the specific actions that an animal takes during a set period of time. And thus, we can use this ethogram to quantify specifically what an animal is doing and for how long, and we can then compare it to other individuals in that same environment under different circumstances. So our objective is simply to have y'all go out and learn how to properly collect scientific data and what factors need to be considered to properly test a hypothesis. And so in order to do that, y'all are gonna go out there and do one of your, on your own. So y'all are gonna complete an ethogram from an individual animal for 10 minutes. All I'm asking you to do, step outside, find a lizard, a squirrel, and just sit and watch it for 10 minutes. How does it interact with the people around you? How does it interact with the environment? Is it foraging? Is it trying to hide? Is it you know, looking for things? That's what you wanna look for. Ultimately, when you do this information, you're gonna put things into kind of like these groups of four categories of like what you're gonna call, call this data so that we can actually look at it a little bit more systematically. And then you're gonna submit this into this Google Docs form um, and that way we can put it all into a big Excel file and actually do some really cool stats with it and show you all at the end. And here's that rubric that I, I basically set outside. Five points if you just simply go out and watch the animal for 10 minutes. A point for identifying when and the, the, or when they saw that animal. A point for the student identifying the weather conditions. And three points if the student uploaded the data to that Google form document. So make sure you're showing visual evidence that that happened. So here's what these actually look like. So have just a simple little table here that goes minute one, two, to 10. And you'll basically mark with a little X that communicate with others in the same species, flee from predators slash humans, or to move around, sit still for other. So for instance, here, I had a little anole or a cedar tree frog that I was watching. It sat still for about six minutes. They realized I was there, it fled. And then the other, I wrote that the animal fled away from me. Really simple, right? Don't just sit around and not do this assignment. It can take 15 minutes if you really want to take. And so let me show you what this actual form looks like real quick. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. The big thing is I want to make sure that like it has to be at least for five minutes. That's kind of the rule. So if you lose it after three, you probably need to go find another critter. But let me show y'all real quick that um, actual form itself, if this will cooperate. Of course. Yep, any animal. Don't leave just yet. We still got five more minutes. Of course, I pulled this up earlier, and now it's just being an absolute pain. Go figure. But maybe one second. There we go. All right. So see, this is going to be really easy to set to, to fill out. The Google form link is in the actual assignment itself. So if you download it, follow the rubric explicitly. If you do exactly what is in the rubric and follow that exact same model for that I put it as a sample submission, you get 10 out of 10 points. If you don't, you will lose points. But here you can actually see an example of it real quick. It's simply just what is your name? What species did you observe? What day the animal was observed? What time the animal was observed? The weather conditions? We just picked sunny, cloudy, and rainy. Just to kind of simplify things down a little bit. And then, okay, what did that animal do, do during minute one? Communicate in the majority of time. So say for greater than 30 seconds of that minute, if you will. 
Was that animal just sitting and hanging out? Was it fleeing from something? Was it trying to look for food? Say, for instance, a little squirrel digging for nuts somewhere, that kind of thing. Does anybody have any big questions about this stuff? Yes. Try to go as far as you can, but what I'm going to ask y'all to do is when you observe the animal, just put the little iNaturalist observation up since y'all know that platform as well. And that way I can guarantee that the thing actually existed somewhere. Yeah. Sorry? Yes. So um, honestly, just do kind of like what we did with the uh, screenshots with the iNaturalist assignment. Take a screenshot of your iNaturalist observation for this organism, and then take a screenshot of your submission for this form. If all fails, I can always double check it, but there's 400 of y'all. It's really hard to double check and make sure every single person submitted it through two different platforms. So do what you can to make my life a little bit easier. Um, I'm happy to keep looking for things, but just go ahead and submit the, the screenshot. It'll make everything better. So, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Yeah, you can be on campus. So for instance, if you're out like on the beach somewhere in Washington and see some really cool looking birds, or if you're out at Blue Springs, so getting ready to have the big manatee rocks, you can go out there and sit and watch the animals interact. Yeah. Yes, so it's just a, because I have to have a visual form of saying, hey, this is what I filled out. So, sorry. You can if you want. Honestly, that'd be really useful. And that way you can just take a screenshot of that, or not screenshot, but you can take a subset of that and use that as your observation for INAT. And you can use that to say, yeah, it was clearly just sitting here doing nothing. Sorry that there's nothing cool. But what will be really cool is, is because we have these very well defined things, we can look at, you know, how long did it take for that animal to run away from you? Or uh, what kind of conditions were, so for instance, if you're talking about a lizard that's going to probably be out like foraging in this more sunny or brighter weather, and if you don't see it doing much in the rain, it's just sitting and hanging out, you can see those differences in the behavior and why those things might be changed as a result. And so that's why we're playing around with being able to scientifically show how these things factor. Yeah. Any other questions? I promise it won't be too bad. It, it's I did this as just kind of a practice assignment for me and Katie. It took us 15 minutes to fill out the form after we had watched the animal. And so it really doesn't take long to do. And like I said, the whole point of these assignments is to have a little bit of fun, engage with the real world when it comes to biology, and take advantage of those moments. So that way you're not all reliant on having to you know, have all of your grades come from tests. That sucks. All right. Does anybody have any other questions? Okay. So just a reminder, quiz 12 is due at a normal time. Final exam is on the 10th. This connecting with biology assignment is due on December 1st. And keep an eye out. I'll be publishing the extra credit for exam four if you're student. Thank you.